Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Protecting Agents, Part 2, Security Agreement Insights and Updates. Hi, I'm Judy Howard, the Manager of Customer Experience and Training here at ARC, and I'll be your host. Uh, this, like I said earlier, this is Part 2. We conducted our first session on January 26, um, and this is a follow-up. And to present today and to answer any of your questions, um, we have Rich Locato, Vice President, Enterprise Risk, uh, and he's the Chief Information and Security Officer, Keith Miles, Senior Manager, Security Assurance, uh, along with Brian Combs, Senior Information Security Engineer, and we also have Cornelius Hatting, who most of you are probably familiar with, uh, Director of Revenue Integrity, Compliance, and Accreditation. But before I turn it over to Rich, I just want to go over a few housekeeping um, items. This is an interactive session, so um, unlike a lot of our webinars, we are going to allow you to raise your hand, and you can do that by going to the right-hand side of your screen in the control panel, um, and you'll, there's an option um, that it allows you to raise your hand. Raise your hand, we'll get to your question as soon as possible. There's also the option, which we always do, is you can write your question in on the control panel in the right-hand side where it says questions. And we'll get to as many questions, whether you raise your hand or you write your question in, as we possibly can today for any of the ones that we don't get to or are of, um, more individual in nature, we'll contact you after the webinar ends. Uh, this is a question we always get. <laughs> is this going to be recorded? And it is. We'll, you'll be able to find this session, this recorded session, after we leave here today. Early next week, it'll be posted on our, our corp.com website under webinars on demand. This will also be sent in the follow-up thank you email, uh, this recorded session. Uh, and again, if you ever have any questions, you can always reach out um, to our CCC uh, or myself, jhoward at ourcorp.com. Okay, without further ado, Rich, I'm gonna turn it over to you to get started. Okay. Thank you, Judy. And thank you for everyone on attending today. Um, the purpose of today's session is really to go over the um, reasonable care requirements in detail. So let's take a quick look at what they are and then we're gonna go through these one by one. So there are 10 requirements um, related to the ARA changes and for 2024. Um, here are the 10 right here, and as I said, we're gonna go through each one of these in detail. So we'll talk about the requirement, and then we'll have uh, some time for Q&A on each requirement, and then we'll also have Q&A at the end in case anybody has additional questions about anything that we're talking about. Um, again, we want this to be interactive, so uh, back and forth. So if there are any questions, feel free to raise your hand or to ask a question in the chat. So let's go to the first one and we'll start with number one in detail. So the first requirement is uh, the effective and unique electronic challenge and authentication for all login credentials or security credentials, including but not limited to any credentials used to access system providers. This includes, for example, usernames, PIN, TCC, and password, or any user accessing agent hardware systems or any other systems or hardware, which can be used to issue ARC traffic documents and transactional data. So what does that mean? What this really means is that we want each user to have a unique uh, user ID and password, um, and people should not share IDs if possible, um, or share passwords. Uh, if you are sharing a computer, we would ask that uh, as somebody's using the computer when they're finished, they log out so the next person can log in so that there's no reuse of the same user ID and password for different people. So that's the requirement. Are there any questions about that requirement specifically? If we go back to the previous slide. Slide two. Keith? All right, so for this requirement, if permitted by a system provider, passwords that conform with the following criteria. 14 characters or more in length, a combination of uppercase and lowercase letters, numbers, and, and symbols, a password that's unique to the system and different from previous passwords. So particularly for this requirement, you wanna ensure you're building strong passwords by either using passphrases, which are more easily rememberable by nature uh, and harder to guess, or by using password managers for creating unique complex passwords. Also, we wanna make sure you do not reuse passwords across multiple accounts. 
Any questions Keith, on that just, slide? Keith, just uh, on that password length, um, it's stating here, it says you have as permitted by your system provider. So not all system providers uh, might apply a 14 character um, required password length, correct? And so we're just saying here, it's if permitted, the best practice is a 14 character. That's correct. You want to use at least 14 characters. You may run across systems that only require an eight character password, and we want to go beyond that. Okay, as, as you add additional characters to your password, you increase the empathy um, for which entropy, excuse me, um, for which a password can be broken. Um, so it increases the time that it would take to break your password if someone was doing some kind of brute force attack. Thank you. Uh, number three. Uh, we have uh, the use of multi-factor authentication when made available by a system provider. That includes single sign-on solutions. Uh, what multi-factor means is uh, a f two uh, different types of factors. So it could be something you know, something you have, or something you are. Uh, something you know would be a password or a PIN. Something you have is either a software token or a hardware token. Uh, and something you are. That could be uh, facial recognition, a fingerprint, um, or any other biometric uh, identification. MFA does require at least two of these. Um, it does not require all three. Um, and there are common uh, MFA solutions like Google Authenticator, Duo, and Microsoft Authenticator. And in this requirement, um, it's mainly for access to the system providers in, in this instance, this doesn't at the moment apply to the ARC environment. Is that is that an accurate statement? I know there's some changes coming for ARC around this, but I, the way this requirement is put forward here is that it's really specific to your system, to your GDS, and obtaining that multi-factor at that GDS level. Yes, that's correct. Anywhere uh, where it is possible to enable multi-factor, it would be uh, strongly recommended that you enable that. Yeah, thanks. Oh, sorry, we have one other question. Um, and as, as I said, it, please define system provider. In this case, the so system provider would be your GDS. That's correct. All right. Does, another question. Sorry, does Saber have multi factor? Saber does have multi factor authentication available. There you go. I'm sorry, was that a question, Cornelius? That was a question I answered it. <laughs> okay. All right. right, quick. I want to make sure we're okay. All right, requirement number four uh, installation and recording of logs of all security patches and system updates made available by agent's computer operating system provider and browser. So this, we just want to make sure that uh, logs are enabled so that in case uh, an incident occurs, that they uh, we can examine the logs and see uh, what happened. We'll go into this into a little more detail on subsequent slides. Um, so, but we just want to make sure that uh, logging is enabled in your operating system and the browser that you're using. And um, Rich, there is someone that has their hands raised. Michael, can you, you're unmuted, can you speak? There's a couple of questions we can read out. Okay, um, if that's okay if you want to do that. Um, so I'll just start here, like rolling in. There's a statement here that we just need to clear up um, of that there's a cost to the uh, Saber multi factor authentication. I would recommend you check in with Saber on that because they have changed, to my knowledge, that requirement. But it's best to um, call them up and talk to them directly and see what those those changes are in relation to obtaining multi-factor. All right, and again, if uh, microphones aren't working or anything, just type in the question and we'll answer it um, on, from the chat. So, Keith? Yeah, so requirement number five. So installation and maintenance of industry standard antivirus software, firewall software, and anti-malware software on all agents' computers and the regular use thereof and maintenance of logs for such use. Um, so the key takeaway from this requirement here is to ensure that your antivirus and firewall features are enabled on your machines. That's for both Mac and Windows. 
Uh, we provided examples in the documentation for validating these native features are enabled on both Windows and Mac. Um, antivirus is enabled by default in Windows 10 and later. Uh, you also have the ability to utilize third-party products to address your antivirus needs if necessary. Um, unfortunately, we can't provide examples for every OS version and type, uh, but we do have a video demonstration we're going to show here for how to check that your Windows Defender firewall is enabled. To verify Windows Defender Firewall is turned on, follow these steps. Select the Start button, then select Settings. Begin typing Firewall in the Find a Setting search bar. Select Windows Defender Firewall. A green shield with a check mark will indicate that the firewall is turned on for private and guest or public networks, respectively. Thanks for that. And as we move along here, so here again, we have a note that antivirus is enabled by default for Mac OS. And then we have steps for validating that Apple firewall is enabled on your Mac OS. Uh, again, you have options for utilizing third party products to deliver functionality um, for each of these features. And now we have another video demonstration on how to enable Apple firewall on your Mac. Firewall is not enabled on Mac by default. To turn Mac OS Firewall on, follow these steps. Open System Settings and type Firewall. Select Turn Firewall On or Off. Then select Firewall. Enable Firewall by clicking the radial. For number six, um, we have uh, the use and maintenance of effective and current anti-spam and anti-phishing email filtering systems and the effective use of anti-phishing training. Um, phishing training is one of the most effective ways to prevent uh, becoming a victim of, uh, of malicious, uh, malicious activity, uh, especially on your accounts. Um, and developing a culture of awareness is also paramount. Um, Make sure that you alert your employees to the risks. Uh, you can ask your IT provider or designated employee as a security manager. Um, keep tabs on current events related to uh, cybersecurity and phishing events. There is a hand raised. Um, let's see if we can get somebody to speak. <laughs> um, this is Daniel Zambo. You are unmuted. Oh, you're self-muted actually, Daniel, so you would have to unmute yourself um, if you want to ask your question. There's a few Daniels, that's why I said your last name. <laughs> okay, let's continue on. Um, Daniel, like um, Richard said earlier, you can always type your question in the um, control panel on your right. Thank you. Okay, uh, requirement number seven, um, appropriate maintenance of security encryption and password protection on agent's computer and any wireless internet systems used by agent's computer. So we want to make sure that uh, as your that your workstation is secure. So that's the use of um, encryption on the on the machine as well as making sure that if you're using a wireless system that encryption is enabled. And one we have an example here of um, wireless settings here to communicate with um, a wireless access point and, and showing where you might change how you're communicating with the access point. All right, for encryption, uh, device encryption. So there's different settings on Windows or Mac OS. Um, and we have examples of that. So we'll be showing a video uh, shortly. But uh, for each one of the machines, what this would mean is if you encrypt your machine, uh, that if anybody was able to uh, obtain your machine, that they would have to have a key to uh, access any of the data on it. Uh, normally, this is in the form of a password, um, but uh, it can be other, other ways as well. So I think the next slide, we have a, the video to show kind of how you uh, enable uh, encryption on Windows and on Mac OS.
Device encryption may not be enabled by default on all Windows machines. To verify, follow these steps. Select the Start button, then select Settings. Begin typing BitLocker in the Find a Setting search bar. Select Manage BitLocker. This page will indicate if BitLocker is on or off. If BitLocker is turned off, select Turn on BitLocker and follow the prompts. If your machine is equipped with Apple Silicon or an Apple T2 security chip, your data is encrypted automatically. Otherwise, follow these steps to verify if File Vault is enabled. On your Mac, choose Apple Menu, System Settings, and click Privacy and Security in the sidebar. Then click File Vault on the right. You may need to scroll down. If enabled, you will see Turn Off as an option. If not enabled, click Turn On and follow the prompts. So device encryption is a good idea whether uh, we're talking about a PC or a mobile device. Um, it's a good safety measure in case anything is lost or stolen, uh, which is why it's recommended. Are there any questions about the previous slide and the video? I do have some folks. I'm going to try to raise the hand again. <laughs> um, Claudia, you're unmuted if you still have a question. Um, also, Cynthia Spencer and um, Daniel Ashmore, if you have any questions. The three of you are unmuted. Claudia, Cynthia, Daniel, anyone still have a question? Otherwise, if that's not coming through, we can go to the uh, typed in questions. Great. Thanks, Cornelius. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, a good one. This is from Patricia. Um, how can you prove to ARC that you have the security you are requiring? That would be based on the logs that, that the agent has to send to us, correct? Yes. That's why we talked about the logging. So uh, for a lot of these pieces, it would be through the logs. Uh, sometimes we might have to see a, a setting such as the uh, encryption piece, but sometimes those things are on the logs as well. Okay. Another question is, how does enabling BitLock affect the user's workflow and use? Um, enabling BitLocker or FileWall on your Mac should be fairly uh, transparent. Um, there, there shouldn't be anything you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, at login um, or anything like that. What that is there to prevent is uh, unauthorized access whenever you're not logged into the machine. So if the machine has been turned off and you're traveling or you're logged out, uh, people that don't have your passwords would not be able to get to your files because they are encrypted. Another question is, what is required for computers not owned or managed by the company slash independent contractors that do have GDS access? You want me to reread re it? So you're asking uh, yeah. about... Yes. So, I, so if I... This would probably... This would be in relation to independent contractors who do have GDS access, um, but these are not computers owned or managed by the um, main agency. So these would be subcontractors or independent contractors working through an agency who might have GDS access, who's, who's to control their systems, who's, in, who's responsible at the end of the day for those systems. I would I would say the independent contractor is responsible for their system and the same requirements apply to independent contractors as to the agency. So would it be right to say that the requirements we're discussing here today 
is the responsibility of the agency who's signing up the subcontractors or independent contractors to cascade those requirements down to those independents. Yes, correct. That's where I was going to go. Okay. Is there anything else, Judy? Um, no, not right now. Okay. Thanks. Okay, that's it. All right, requirement eight. The attendance of agent and all personnel issuing ARC traffic documents at, at ARC approved fraud and security webinars and training in the previous 12 months. So we wanna make sure that we keep things current and keep people aware of um, anything that's going on in terms of fraud and security. So you must attend uh, one of the webinars and uh, have, have proof of that. Um, the previous webinar that we started with well, last month, uh, there was a code that people had to have uh, to show that they had taken the webinar uh, and that was approved training. So if everybody attended that training, that would be, uh, that would meet this requirement that we have here in section eight. Okay, so for requirement nine, installation of computer operating system updated with all latest patches and with automatic updates enabled. Um, for this one, we wanna see that automatic updates is enabled. Uh, it's one of the simplest and effective uh, preventions to implement. Uh, ensures your machine is updated and protected against the latest OS vulnerabilities. Um, we have provided a few examples here in the documentation for verifying these features are enabled for both Windows and Mac. And again, we're gonna have a video here that we're gonna show um, to demonstrate uh, enabling those automatic updates for each of those operating systems. To verify automatic updates are enabled, follow these steps. Select the Start button, then select Settings. Begin typing Update in the Find a Setting search bar. Select Windows Update Settings. Ensure Get the Latest Updates as Soon as They're Available is set to On. If not, select the radial to turn on automatic updates. To verify automatic Mac OS updates are enabled, follow these steps. On your Mac, choose Apple Menu, System Settings, then click General in the sidebar. You may need to scroll down. Select Software Update on the right. Automatic updates should be set to On. To set update options, Click the Info button for automatic updates and ensure the following are enabled. To have your Mac check for updates automatically, turn on Check for Updates. To have your Mac download updates without asking, turn on Download New Updates when available. To have your Mac install Mac OS updates automatically, turn on Install Mac OS Updates. To have your Mac install application updates from the App Store automatically, turn on Install Application Updates from the App Store. To have your Mac install system files and rapid security responses automatically, turn on Install Security Responses and System Files. Click Done. Tenth change uh, is internet browsers are installed with latest patches and with automatic updates enabled. Um, automatic updates are actually uh, enabled by default on most modern day browsers. So this shouldn't be a change that uh, you should have to make yourself, uh, but it would be good to make sure that those have not been turned off inadvertently. Um, the, uh, it's also recommended um, to Change, close out your browser if you see uh, a notification that there has been an update applied. Um, that way, if there are any background changes to the browser that, are, uh, that need to happen, it can do so, and then you'll be able to reopen. That should not require a reboot of your machine. I do have a question here. Oh, this by uh, for Sylvia. Sylvia Rice, you're unmuted if you still have your question. Yes. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. Can you? 
Okay. Yes. Um, my question was actually in reference to everything that that we are supposed to do as a company. We already have it implemented, and we actually provide the computers to each of our agents. And I'm seeing that the training that they require, which is this one, will allow them to be touching a lot of stuff that we normally don't allow them to touch. <laughs> so my question to you is, uh, all of our ticketing agents are required just to see these webinars, or can I show them other webinars that are more related to like phishing emails or fraud or other stuff instead of actually going into the computer and looking for the things that they need to be updating because there are already implemented in their computers. So just to clarify, you have an administrator that has established all of these parameters on the computers that you then issue to your contractors, correct? Correct. Okay, so yeah. over to you, Rich or Keith. So yeah, my recommendation would be, since you already have a department that handle these configurations, to send out a unified message. You know, there's no need to check or change any of these settings. They've already been pre-configured for you. Um, to answer your other question, certainly, we, we want to make sure folks are continuously educating and raising awareness on current factors from, you know, social engineering, phishing. Um, so certainly supplement any of the trainings we provide with your own trainings as well. And there will be additional training okay. that comes out uh, later on in the year to meet those requirements so that there would be different that was pieces than just uh, the uh, reasonable care requirements. So we will have additional training around. Right. And then anything that's okay, available. I, was like, I, don't have, I don't have to require them to, do, to watch this video instead and I can wait for the next one that is going to come along. That was my question. Because we have about 30 agents, so it's going to take them, you know, for a while for all of them. And just to watch a video that is actually not related to anything that they have to do, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm wondering whether, you know, I can show them another one instead of this and still get credited that they watched, you know, what they were supposed to. Yeah, I, be I believe that will be okay. I don't know, Cornelius, is there a requirement that everyone think, watches the first yeah. video or not? I don't know. Yeah, I think let's, um, if we can touch base with you um, after this call um, uh, independently to discuss um, how best to apply um, this requirement to your sub agencies, I think that will be a uh, better use of our time. So if we can maybe, Judy, if we can just um, get the name, get something set up for maybe tomorrow or so just to talk this through um, and then see what the best way forward is there. Okay, great. And that okay, would that'll be perfect. And that was Sylvia, right? Yes, total oh. travel. Yep, I got you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, there is uh, someone else that has their has had their hand raised. Um, let me just go back. I believe it's Barbara. If you still have your question. Uh, Barbara. Barbara Long, I believe it is. Oh, okay. Barbara, you can speak if you're unmuted. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I was say, I'm muted. I can't speak. I'm muted now. All right. Um, knowing that I was going to uh, watch this webinar, one of the agency owners asked, what is the best documentation out of the ARA that covers forgiven liability um, as it relates to this uh, the cybersecurity requirements? And and I'm not finding anything that looks like that specific language. So I just wanted to know what section is best to hand to him. And so where does reasonable care requirements come in? Is that kind of a, a catch-all for we've done everything we can do, but we've still got a cyber security issue. Uh, so I, I guess I'd just like, I need more explanation on that or where do I go to find it? Or if this needs to be offline, who do I talk to? Yep, so to answer the first one, um, just make sure you're in the latest um, ARA agreement. I mean, it's been updated as of January 30th. Right. So make sure you've got the latest one and the criteria is defined under section B. Section um, B, okay. ARA. 
So it goes into the um, into those sections. Um, and then for the other question around liability, um, just drop me an email. I'll you know work through Judy and we can discuss that with you uh, separately. Okay, very good. Yeah. And he's he's actually traveling internationally, so it may be next week when he's back in. Okay. Um, I'll print off section B and give it to him, and then I'm sure he'll have some questions on it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Great. And Barbara, if you want to um, connect with Cornelius, just send me an email, jhoward at artcorp.com, and I'll get that set up if you still okay. have a need. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm just looking to see if anyone else um, has their hand raised. Lorraine, um, you had a question. You wrote it in. I just am checking to make sure that you got everything answered. You're unmuted if you wanted to speak. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, back to number eight. Do you notify the agencies of which agents take the test? Or how do you know how many take it here? So can you repeat that again? Sorry. It's a bit, it came in broken. Be better. Do you notify the agency if not all the agents have watched and took the quiz? If they've not watched and taken the quiz. Would you uh, would you let the agency know who's taking who's taken the quiz or taken the training that's required? Yep. From the January 26th webinar. Yeah, we know we can tell who has taken them. And then and then, of course, who we don't, we can't see who's not taken them because we don't have a list of. Well, it depends. If they registered in our system, we can we match with our systems if they are registered individual within the in our in our, our CRM environment. We can match and confirm that way that they did. But if you have any other agencies who might not be in our system, we don't, we won't be able to tell that. So we confirm and validate against the names and individuals we have in our system to have taken the test. Okay, thank you. And Lorraine, if you wanted to provide us with a list of agents you're looking to see if they did take it, we could validate that, um, correct Cornelius? Absolutely, and yeah. And let and let you know. So if you want to do that, um, again, please send me an email. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, I'm just looking to see who else. Cornelius, did you have any written um, questions in? Oh uh, yeah. Go through the list and see. Okay. Um, it's a couple of things. Okay, Judy, this might be one for you. Is there anything we can receive to show that we attended these webinars as we need to let our managers know that we did? Uh, yeah, if you. Um, want to send me um, an email at, again, jhoward at artcorp.com. Uh, I will be happy to um, provide you uh, who's attended what. If you give me a list of um, agents that you would like to see who attended the January 26th and this February one, I'll be happy to, to, to look and see and provide you if they did or didn't. Here's another question, um, system related question. What if I don't want to use auto updates? Um, I mean, if there's a, if there's a reason, uh, and it could be a very valid reason that you don't want to do automatic updates, uh, it would be strongly recommended that you at least go in on a regular basis and check and apply for updates to your system and software. Is there a particular 
time period in which that needs to be done. So once a month, every other month. What well, the, whole, the whole reason why we have automatic updates set, to be honest, to make sure that all updates are applied. And and so I, I can't think of a good reason, and it would be uh, opposite to what we're st stating in the requirements to turn them off. So if there's a particular problem or issue that you have, we certainly can discuss it offline. But uh, if automatic updates are not enabled, then it does not meet the requirements within the ARA. It's a necessary evil, <laughs> if you want to look at it that way. I mean, we get it. It's, it's a good one practice, on my... right? Because if you don't yeah. have it set, what happens is you forget. And then to your point, Cornelius, where you mentioned about how often, right? Then is it every week that I apply it? Is it every other week that I forget this week? next month whatever so by having all automatic updates enabled that takes everything out of the uh, equation and um, the updates are, are relevant and current and uh, your, your machine should be in the best state possible if they're and, and the reason for the update is because they, an, a vulnerability was identified in the previous version i would imagine right so in order to fulfill or make sure you've got the right and most up-to-date version you are um, ensuring that you don't have any potential for additional breaches or gaps in your security. Correct. Let's see if we have anything else. Uh, Cornelius, I have someone that's raised their hand. I think I'm oh, okay. this Sorry. correctly. <laughs> uh, Moria uh, Zupan, if you. Uh, it's Mora. Yeah, can you Mora. hear me? Yes, I can. Um, I just wondered if there is anything that you could send out, like an email that we could forward to our agents, sort of explaining this, you know, in a brief paragraph, um, along with, you know, some sort of language so that we, I wouldn't have to try to explain it. So I think uh, the, the webinar itself will be posted on the website along with uh, an FAQ discussing each one of the requirements and examples. So uh, that's what we would have available uh, to point anyone to if they needed additional information or just even the, the details. So the webinar from January will be there. This webinar will be there as well as a FAQ document to take a look at in terms of uh, the requirements and any of the details. Right. And okay. Yep. Yeah. And that supplemental guide will be coming out the next week or so, and it'll include a background as to why, you know, the, these are the security requirements that we're enabling, and as you mentioned, how to enable those. Great. Thank you, Keith, for because um, it won't be out today. <laughs> it, the mm -hmm. supplemental document that um, Rich and Keith are referring to will be posted. Um, we're working with a marketing group, and hopefully by the end of next week, mm -hmm. this recorded webinar will be posted early next week. So thank you. Question on BitLocker, does it affect network access? It's not. Uh, no, it, it does not uh, interact with uh, with network access at all. Okay, thank you. How does enabling BitLocker affect the user's workflow and use, if, if at all? Um, I we believe we earlier. Oh, we did. Uh, so. yes. Yeah, we answered that one earlier. And I'm just going to chime in. If anyone wants to speak up, um, I know Cornelius is going through and reading the ones that have been written in, but if there's any other questions, um, just please raise your hand by going to, again to the control panel uh, so that we can make sure that we're getting everyone's questions answered. Um. Cornelius, anything more on your end? There's one question here. Um, our systems show updates that are ready to install. 
and we apply them after we've saved our work. But they don't do it automatically. I hope this is acceptable, is, is the question. Um, yes, you want to applied in a timely manner, right? So normally what happens there is, and um, uh, is that uh, updates are, are set up, they're, they're downloaded, and then you get to choose when to install them. And normally you don't want to interrupt work. So the end of day is, is fine. So if there's an option that says install later, as long as they get installed, that's what we want to make sure happens. And that that delay is not longer than a few days, right? So a day is fine, um, but you want to try to apply them timely. So end of day, perfectly acceptable. Okay. And there's not, nothing else in at the moment. Okay. And um, thanks, Cornelius. And I'm just looking to see if anyone else has raised their hand. We'll stay on here. Oh, let's see. Um, Della Brown, I know you've asked a question in the panel, um, but your hand keeps coming up being raised. Do you have a question? Yes. You're unmuted. Yes. Oh, great. Um, I was trying to, as you were demonstrating, to turn on BitLocker, I don't seem to have it in my Windows 10 operating system. So is there a way that I can uh, get BitLocker? Yeah, so more than likely you have a, a home license for Windows. Um, although BitLocker is available on Windows 10 and 11, it's typically available on the professional level license. Um, so I, I would look at potentially upgrading your license from home to professional. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question just came in on BitLocker. Will, does it require a Windows login and password? Um, so from, from the perspective of a Windows account that is signed up for Windows Mail, uh, so much like a Google account, it does not require that. Uh, but as far as requiring a local account on the machine that you use for a, win for a username and password, uh, yes, that is correct. It does require that. Any other questions? Any hands raised, Judy? No, I'm just going through Cornelius. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, if anyone still does have a question they'd like to ask verbally, um, just click the raise the hand on your control panel. And I'm just going to scroll here one more time, Cornelius. Daniel, I see your hands up. Did we answer your question? Yeah, Daniel's hand is stuck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I I took your hand down, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you. Can we help you? Um, Rich, Brian, Keith, any um, thing else you'd like to get in? Um, before we close out of here today, and we'll still taking in questions um, for the next few minutes. But is there anything, Absolutely. any closing sentiments? No, just want to thank everybody for all their questions. If there's additional questions, certainly after the uh, presentation today, you can send an email to the uh, address below or uh, to Judy, and uh, we will we will answer whatever anyone has. Okay, Sylvia has a question. Sylvia, are you able to come off mute? Yep, let me see if we can take her off. Um, here you go, Sylvia, if you still have a question. Okay, now. Okay, yes, I have one more question. Uh, we have implemented a lot of um, security in, in, play, in, our, in our agency, and one of the things that we did was started sending out encrypted emails and we're getting a lot of complaints from our clients that they don't want encrypted email. We even had one client saying that if send one more email encrypted, they will no longer do business with us. And we're kind of wondering, uh, how can we protect ourselves from that in the sense that since we're implementing all the requirements that ARC is asking from us, how do we pass that on to the client saying, okay, we are implementing all this security because we have to, you know, not because we want to, and also to protect ourselves. Uh, 
Uh, the, yeah, I mean, I think the, the best response is that, you know, you're also protecting them. Um, you know, it may be an extra step. I'm not exactly sure, you know, what that extra step would be on their end. Um, I'm guessing if it's going through like an iron port or such, they've got to log in to collect that email. Um, but yeah, I mean, education on how implementing such a thing is is also protecting their information, right? It prevents their information from being stolen or from them, you know, them being infect, uh, affected by, um, you know, some type of data privacy breach or, or stolen identity. Um, Depending on how the uh, email encryption is, is implemented, right? Uh, to Keith's point, if there is an extra step, sometimes that gets uh, aggravating to people, but the whole purpose of encrypted email is to protect sensitive information, whether that might be, um, you know, travel information or uh, payment information, um, even if it's just a, you know, a confirmation code or something like that. So it, it is further protection. I think that's, uh, again, as Keith said, that's what I would point out, but Sometimes, depending on how uh, it is implemented, and I don't know what your mail system is, um, some are yeah, a little bit more. There's a lot. It does require a login, so I think that's where it's bothering the you know the clients, the fact that they need the extra step in order to to get the information. Because it's mainly in the accounting department that we're using it. You know that we started with the accounting. You know to eventually pass it on also. You know to the travel part of it. But we're having so many issues with clients in the accounting that we put a big hold in the front. <laughs> yeah, there, you know, with um, you know, if if it's a third party product that's doing that, then yes, there would be a separate login. Uh, sometimes there's options, you know, to if you have it uh, within Microsoft Exchange, then sometimes it can be a little bit more seamless, but it really depends on how your email system is implemented in your company. Question coming up around this um, uh, encrypted email piece is does ARC or will ARC require encrypted emails to be used by agents? And I don't, I think that's an individual business decision. Yeah, not at the present time, right? Again, we're 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 concerned with how uh, the system providers are accessed, and so we want to make sure uh, that that interaction is uh, is as secure as it can be. Um, I don't think we'll expand beyond that. Uh, so at the time, we're not requiring um, encrypted email, although certainly we utilize it in our company. So if we do have interactions with anyone uh and it needs and it's sensitive in nature we will encrypt the email and um as i said how it works for us is 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 seamless if people's systems are compatible with it they won't even know that it's been encrypted um but if they're not then they would have to have a login like we talked about earl earlier but for the most part the majority of systems do not need a separate login to access the email it just gets delivered to them seamlessly is there another question? Is there any other product besides BitLocker that could be applied? Or that operates similar to BitLocker? So for Windows operating systems, is there anything else that can be applied? Keith or Brian? I don't I don't know. There there are different um there are different solutions. Um generally most of those solutions are tailored to large organizations so they can manage the encryption keys of, of things like that. Uh, BitLocker for Windows is probably the, the most seamless uh, solution. And as long as you have, uh, as Keith mentioned earlier, um, a professional edition or license for Windows 10 or 11, uh, it should be included at no extra charge. Thank you. And yes, there is a question that if this is going to, this is recorded, this is going to be made public uh, or available to the audience. And uh, so you will have ability to go back and watch this uh, session again and all previous ones as well. Any other hands up or? Uh, 
No. See, Daniel's hand still up. Is he, Daniel, are we? I think Daniel, from anything? what I understand, Daniel can't put his hand down. We take it down and it comes back up. My apologies. Uh, Daniel, Daniel, I will um, unmute you just to make sure that's still the case. Hang on one second, Cornelius. Um, okay. Oopsie. Uh, he's self-muted. Sorry, Daniel, you're self-muted. If you want to um, come off mute, you can ask a question if you have one. Um, oh, no question. Thank you for confirming. Okay, perfect. Cornelius, no more on your end. Um, no more hands raised. Rich, Keith, Brian, again, any closing remarks before we leave here today? Okay. Thank you everyone for your time. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you. And I want to thank um, especially everyone that attended here today. This is such an important topic. As um, everyone on the panel has alluded to, we did have a session on January 26th. It is posted. Please take a look at it, um, review it. It's recorded. You can pass it along to others um, in your organization that have a need to, to view it. Uh, for ticketing agents, there is that quiz that you can take um, once you watch that recorded video, and that is all on our website. Uh, this one will be posted early next week, and along with that supplemental document, hopefully by the end of uh, next week. If you have any questions, um, again, email stopfraud at rcorp.com. That's the best source. It'll be all funneled in for our panel here to take a look at. Again, stopfraud at rcorp.com. For those of you that um, we did mention, um, or you can reach out to me, Jay Howard at artcorp.com and happy and happy to help. Um, otherwise, I want to give a big thank you too for, for our presenters, to Rich, to Keith, to Brian, of course, Cornelius. Um, we spend a lot of time with Cornelius doing webinars. Um, but if um, there's anything, again, once we leave here today, um, please reach out and look for more uh, webinars to come, whether it's on this topic or other topics that ARC is offering. We're always happy to have you join us. Okay, thanks again for everyone that took the time to attend today.